spirit of cooperation will continue in the future. Besides seeing the many antiques and items of interest, you will also see a birch broom being made and a mat being hooked. Many of you already know how to hook a mat or run a bro broom. However, it is becoming a lost art and a number of you have never seen it done before. I sincerely hope that the items you are about to see will interest you very much. For those of you who are not familiar with the items displayed, I hope you will learn a little about the resourcefulness and history of our ancestors. For those of you who can remember these items, either vaguely or vividly, I hope you, it will take you on a nostalgic journey to the past. Before you watch this film, I would like to issue a challenge to some individual or organized group in this town to take the initiative to start a museum. Virgil could have one of the best museums in Newfoundland. It was suggested to me that Virgil could not afford a museum. My response to that is that we cannot afford not to. Imagine its potential as a tourist attraction. I think we should live according to this motto, live in the present, hope for the future, but preserve the past.
Y'all, you only come pick one here the other day. No, but, but some of us uh, used to have those little small hand rooms. We get get down in a, in a crate and, and wipe them right in, you know? Oh, yeah. Right. You're getting it pretty well ready now to uh, yeah. pull back the yeah. brushes there. <laughs> uh, they all want to be pretty well thin, do they? Uh, oh, yeah, smaller it is better, you know. Like a, you know, make, a, for, make a coarse one, you'd, you know, it, it wouldn't be too potty about it. Uh, what would you want a coarse one for? What's what's? Well, at least from stages, from the boats and that we get you now, and the uh, coarse do is they scratch out the dirt better. What about one you're saying about uh, washing out uh, salt fish? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I, I didn't want to be too coarse for that. Cause I scratch out fish. Oh, I see. Although some people did do that, don't really rock with it. And you, you still continue to do that? Yeah. But more or less for pastime, or is yeah. there a demand for them? Well, you know, well, I'm told to sell them, but uh, most things I do at one or times, but that's something pastime more for anything else. Is there to get sticks around here, see? So where would you have to go and get your sticks then now? <laughs> I would say you're going, what? I would say 50 more if we could get the small birch for the good from the broom stick, then, wouldn't you? Well, I wouldn't know. I, I've run the broom, though, just the same. I, you know. Oh, you made brooms, didn't you? Not very many, but I know, you know, I've tried it and uh, I, I made one, I know. But uh, I don't have the skill not to do it. Everybody used to make them years ago. Yes. They used to be uh, made in the kitchen. Uh, I remember my father running them in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, it's an awful mess, of course. Uh, no, boy. But, I run uh, in the kitchen now. And just sweep up on the camera. Yes. I miss the camera, Richard, right on you. But the ones that come off, you see, uh, I've seen, uh, although I could never do it, make stars out of them, you know? You get your ring out of Yes. And uh, I see another thing. When I was a boy, everybody you're going to everybody's house by smoke. Fifty people smoke pipe. They have a bottle tied up over yes. for dry for lighting pipers. Yes, I've seen that yeah. too, yes. Yes. One of them shavings. Of course they had the ideal cook stoves or the yeah. our own stoves with the big grates on them yeah. and you'd uh, light it from there, right? Eh? Yeah. Yes. Now you got that much done. What about turning to your other end? Now that you were doing Saturday night and uh, you, 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 here, you have uh, at all... Yeah, I, 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 when I, do you say you're finished there? Yeah, well, you got to run right down for plenty of energy. What, what do you mean running right down? What right do you down, mean by that? To, about the of, uh, your finger, the last piece, and it cuts off that stump, see? Oh, yes. Huh? Mm-hmm. And when you get that done, all of this done, what do you do then? How do you, how do you proceed with your broom then? Turns around and runs this way and turns the brush back over. That's the inside part then. Yeah, and uh, you really want those brushes here, uh, about a half inch longer than the other, so they come it over for it to look good, eh? Wait, a little bit longer, you yeah, say? Yeah, a little bit longer than the other one, see? Yeah. And uh, and then when you get some finish, I always take a look at me and it turns to me like getting, you see, notice how the how them rooms I had made was laying and turning in like a, almost like a rose. And, yes. And, but not too many people But do. you do that. Yourself. Not too many people do that, but I, I do just make them look well after way. Yeah. Now you're pulling up the long ones, yeah. the outside ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How long will it take you to run a broom? Well, one of the big ones, uh, for make, uh, uh, make good, and the time I start at, and so I finish it, it will take me over two hours, two hours and a half, I make, uh, yeah, but I do pass that, but I like to, like to try to do it a little bit after the way. Oh, yes, well, it's uh, hard, isn't it? And, uh, yeah. If you're going to do something, I figure just we'll do it, try to do it yeah. the best, best you can, eh? Yes. 
Well, that's really uh, wonderful. Many of the young people here today have never seen anybody no. room, run a broom. You don't no. have to do that kind of stuff today. No. Uh, no, sir. Uh, yes. It's really probably... Uh, yeah, th this is the finished product here, uh, you know, but uh, it's not uh, George Bill's handy work, uh, but it's a finished yeah. product. After you get it all run down, you, you what do you do with the handle? You chop it out? Or? Chopped it with axe, and then I plane some down, see? And I, I, I uh, uh, there, there was a side around there, but I take mine this way, see, look at it. And cut your you know, and they can look better, you know, cut yeah. down there. Yeah. And pocket knife. You see the saw on that and chop it down. It don't look too well that way. No, but uh, if you were going to use it, say, down in the stage or or do yeah, your well, door, Yeah, make them put a stage. I make them the same way. Oh, you're pretty particular about it. Oh, yes. Uh, well, yeah. what looks that will make the, the last way. Yeah, but you're the master at it, aren't you? Well, thank you very much now, and I uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Yes, this is a couch here, and uh, people used to use it in their kitchens for, you know, in the place of a Chesterfield, I suppose, today. And, uh, well, later they had day bids, what they call, you know, rollaway cots. Yes. Yeah, uh, but they had no mattress on this, did they? It was just like oh, yeah, the, some, of some of them did. But uh, I know, when I was well, we had a bottle in our, in our yeah. inside room. He was at, made some of his death, but it, yeah. he was stopped and done. With, yes. With and uh, this is the water hoop here. We have to bring our own water. And this made it much easier because uh, in bringing two buckets of water, uh, it was very difficult. You had to. Uh, lift up on it and uh, and keep out on the buckets at the same time. The now that hoop, you see, would... It's a little too wide. Huh? The Irish well, that was only made for yeah, demonstration. Yeah, yeah but that's what do. Yes. The, your buckets will come here and yeah. take all the animals do. But it would make it much easier, what I was saying, oh, yes, to uh, oh, yes. carry the water oh, yeah. uh, buckets because that hoop would keep it away from your side and then you had to, all you had to do was lift it up. If, if you see fellas uh, have a strap come over the shoulder and hook in the buckets. No, I have not buckets, Some fellas no. do that with like big buckets. Yes. And uh, probably uh, if we could go to the next item here now. And uh, <coughs> this is a 56 weight here. Uh, These old balance weights that they used to have. You used to have hundreds in George. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, uh, you know, I don't know how exactly how to explain it, but uh, it was like a balance. They had a tub on one hand uh, with uh, some rocks in it uh, to weigh down the bar for the weight of the bar. And uh, they used to use these weights. One was seven pounds. That, that's a half cantle, though. Half cantle piece used to be. Yes. Six pounds. And uh, the other one was 28 pounds, 14 pounds. 28 pounds and 56 pounds. And uh, I know as boys, we used to do weight lifting. Now, I was never much good at lifting weights, but some people could put that up over their heads, you see, and, uh, and do the weight lifting. But uh, it was a balance. And of course, people used to have stoves, uh, ideal cook stoves and our own stoves, and they had to polish them. And uh, this was the brush they put the polish on and they used to polish them with that, shine them up with that, you see. And uh, this particular item here is a, uh, a shoe brush. Uh, uh, the shoe brush, <coughs> uh, th this small brush here uh, was to put the polish on the shoes with, and this one was to be shined the polish afterwards. Uh, people used to shine their shoes there. And this is the washstand, the old-fashioned washstand. This is really a, a very old washstand. And uh, it was, uh, you know, used in the porch or in bedrooms too. 
And if they, usually in the bedrooms, they had uh, a, a basin and, uh, and a jug set like this. And this was uh, used if you had guests in your house. They, the water would be taken to the uh, bedroom, and that's where they would wash. And uh, that's really hold too. And uh, you see, it was lucky to get something like that. Now, <coughs> over here we have two receipts here that show the credit system, at, credit system at its best. You see, uh, here the, uh, the person who owned this back in 1942 uh, went fishing. The amount of fish that he caught was recorded here. And then he bought some uh, items, like yeast, for example, that was deducted. And uh, the goods that he bought was subtracted from the amount of fish that he uh, uh, caught. And uh, it was all put on the same bill. And down here, it shows at the end of the bill the balance that he owed, $3.57, you see? And, uh, the same with the other one. And this is an old ration book here that uh, was used during the Second World War. And uh, I understand, I can't hold, uh, remember uh, about it, but uh, I understand that they rationed out milk and sugar. And you had to use these coupons. And uh, I don't know, I think five pounds of sugar at a time, you see. Here, um, some of the coupons are not used, but I am unable to explain uh, any more about it than that. And the person who owned this uh, can't explain it either. I forgot. And this is the, I suppose, uh, the old pepper and salt cap. Uh, it's very old, uh, but it's, uh, that's what it is. And uh, this one here, same thing as the old peak cap. And they had the paper in there. It's still in here. Uh, to sort of keep it stiff, you see, yeah. Yeah, this uh, is. Just be nice. I gotta be, you know, just like a home before it starts. Better behave yourself too. You're on TV. So uh, mats are hooked, and uh, the uh, rags, old rags, are used, and uh, you had to put the rag underneath to hook it up. How far did you hook it up? Now, did you? Just hook it up fair enough so that you can make a little, you know, ridge, eh? And then when you cut it off on that end. What end? That end there. Start back here again. That's if you got small blocks. But if you were going on length, well, naturally, you start there. Start right and come back to the left. Oh, but you start to the right. Oh, yes. Oh. But, but then does that speak as you're... Right-handed. Oh, naturally. Oh. <laughs> and you try to do every seam, because then it'd be neat, like every little line. There's one line yeah. here. So you try to do this one, put that right neat and close together, eh? Uh, every little seam in there had to have... Yeah, not everybody would do it, but uh, I used to do it. Yeah, and that would take you a long time to do that. Oh, yes, a long time. You ain't no hurry, because it's only more of a hobby. Well, it wasn't a hobby one time, though, was it? Well, not really. Yeah, and then they used to put all kinds of designs in these mats. This particular mat here was started a long time ago by um, Mrs. Sims. She's still alive, but she's very old and very sick, too. And she didn't finish it for some reason. And we have permission to just hook in a few lines there to show the people how mats are hooked. Those people who do not know, there are many people in Virgil naturally who know how to do it. But uh, that's how mats are hooked, uh, like that, you see. And they would put their own designs in it, whether it was a dog or... Uh, I know a person who lay a dog down on <laughs> the wrapper one time and drew the dog out, but uh, they weren't an artist. But uh, you put all kinds of flowers and everything else. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you now very much for that. Yes. It's what really appeals to me, I don't know if you can get a good shot at this particular map. <coughs> the George, George Bell was 
running a broom on it Saturday night, but this is a line mat. This is used in place of canvas. It used to be on my home uh, when I grew up. I've unstranded the line a number of times for my mother, whole trawl line, and she used to hook it with the same kind of a mat hooker that Myrtle was using there. Uh, sort of crochet like I suppose, you know, she was, didn't have it on a frame, it wasn't uh, done on a frame. And they used to paint it up and paint their own designs on it. And as you can see that uh, they used to have it very colorful. Uh, there weren't too many bright spots perhaps in their lives in those days. So they liked to have everything decorated perhaps around them. So uh, this is made out of whole tra unstranded trawl line. Uh, now this particular one here is also a line mat, but it was made out of a smaller line, sud line or genjin line, whatever you want to say, I suppose, and it's still unstranded, so it makes a finer mat than this one, you see? But there's so much paint on these mats that uh, they're easily cracked if you uh, are not careful, okay? And this set here is of some interest to me, this table set, because uh, it came from uh, a parlor or uh, an inside room they used to call it. Uh, it used to be uh, the smallest room usually in the house. Uh, today it would be the living room and nobody was allowed in there. The door was always shut except of course when uh, a, a guest would come into your house like a minister or somebody or when somebody died. And this particular set the person I got it from said that she and her brothers used to call this the funeral set because the only chance they really got to sit in the chairs was when somebody died. And uh, it's quite old, it's very old, it's over 100 years old. This is of particular interest here too. This is an old mug, it's a shaving mug. And uh, this is the place you put your soap and that where you put the water here, you see. We have a, uh, a knife razor down there too. And, uh, <coughs> You see, and this is a mustache mug. Uh, mustache must have been pretty popular in those days. This is where your mustache would uh, rest. This particular one, I don't know how old that one is, but this one is about 120 years of age. It came from Pickery. Uh, I got it from uh, Mr. George Coombs, it, and it was his father that owned that. And you can see they came in all shapes and sizes. And uh, they were very loyal to their king and queen and this is a picture of a king here and his wife who would be the queen of course and I suppose it's King Edward I don't know how old that is and neither did they but the uh, and this little handkerchief this used to be popular at one time uh, and this was brought from Sydney or Glazed Bay this particular one was uh, my wife marked on it and people from my hometown used to go there fishing and uh, when this fellow came back he brought back that gift and that's fairly old too and this is a fascinating book it's a 1901 uh, spring summer and uh, fall winter catalog it's all here in one I guess they only put out one catalog and there are it's really interesting uh, the prices here you see uh, You see that uh, there are uh, the clocks here, for example. This particular clock here, which looks uh, is eight dollars ninety uh, nine, ninety cents. You see uh, uh, the rings there. Uh, this one here is a fourteen carat single stone diamond ring. Fifty dollars, a smaller stone, twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars, and thirty-five dollars. You see, and uh, I don't think any of these rings are very expensive, indeed. A ten-carat child's keeper ring, fifty cents. Every year pattern is seventy-five cents. Yes. So, and uh, this is a money box here that came from uh, Francois where you have the whole coast represented uh, down as far as Pickery and uh, this is a money box it's wooden and this is the granny glasses here and uh,
they didn't get their eyes test for these, they could go and buy them for um, 25 cents a pair. You see? And this is a very old platter, as you can see. And, uh, but I don't know how old it is. I do know that it's over 100 years of age. And uh, as you can see, that uh, is very well decorated. And this is a, a license here for uh, a moose or caribou in 1947. And I don't know anything else about that either. OK. Uh, uh, this is a good luck charm here that used to be carried by Captain Frank Francis, uh, a well-known fishing captain uh, here in this area. Uh, and that's a turtle, a brass turtle that he used to carry, I'm told, for good luck. And I know I can remember him coming down to France Way in the Dragger Mustang, and he carried up a good many loads of redfish, so he must have had good luck. But then he was a good fisherman, too. Over here, we have some old muskets. And uh, this particular one here uh, was used during the First World War down in Wheat Bear Bay uh, to kill caribou uh, to send overseas. And the uh, caribou was towed out uh, on the hedge of the house, I'm told. And a steamer used to come in and get that, uh, these, the carcasses. And uh, the man got 25 cents a carcass for, for the caribou. And this particular one is of interest to me, uh, since I do know a little bit about it. It, came, it was bought in Round Counter about 86 years ago uh, by uh, Ben Thorne's father. And uh, he bought it for eight dollars. He bought it from uh, a Mr. Webb. Um, no, that's not the particular one. Uh, yes, he bought it from uh, Billy Webb in... in uh, in round counter for eight dollars and uh, he had to go in the woods and cut down uh, sticks for Mr. Webb's wharf and I don't know how many uh, sticks he had to cut to get eight dollars I expect a good many and uh, Mr. Thorne at that time was 14 years of age when I was 14 I couldn't lift that gun <coughs> and this of course is a well, I don't know about of course, because I don't know too much about guns, but I'm told it's a number 10 long barrel gun. And it was used, of course, to go hunting uh, seabirds. I can't imagine anybody carrying that in the country. It's, it's too heavy for me. And I, I do not know too much about this, but this is a, uh, a double barrel uh, gun. It used to take uh, cartridges, shot. It was a shotgun. But originally, it was used in the South Seas to kill seals. I know that much about it. And uh, this is a bullet that came from uh, one of the two warships that ran aground uh, down around St. Lawrence during the Second World War, uh, either the Truxton or Pollux. And uh, this is a handy aircraft bullet, I understand. And it was retrieved. Uh, by a diver, okay? And uh, this is a cannonball. It came from the Lewisburg area. I don't know any more about it than that. I was told that it got here by, uh, you know, legal means. That's all I know about it, and I'm sure it did. And of course, this is the old powder horns. If you were going shoot, uh, hunting with the muzzleloader, you had to carry your powder in this uh, thing, and also you had to have shot to carry, and you had a shot bag. And some of these are very old too. And this is the a gun belt. This is fairly old, and it was, I think, uh, handmade. I'm not quite sure about that though, but uh, we do have one that was handmade. And uh, they used to do a lot of hunting at one time to get their meat. And this is the old singeing iron. We, we, we call it uh, swinging iron. And uh, you have to put that in the grate of the stove or in the stove to lift the cover off and get it red hot, you see, and to uh, swing, swing the down off the uh, birds. You, you could pick uh, the feathers off, but the down would be left behind, so they uh, uh, singed it off, you see. And I don't know too much about the shell either. But I do know it came from uh, the First World War, 
and it was uh, down in Red's Webb's store, but they think that Mr. Studley had it. But that's all I know about it. If we could move over here, and uh, everybody know that this is a scoop, I suppose, that they used to uh, throw water out of their boats with. Uh, today, I think that uh, art's being lost too, because now I see that they use more uh, Javix bottles than anything else, but it's much uh, bet uh, easier to cut off a Javix bottle, of course, than to make a scoop. Because I know in my hometown they used to say that it was a sign of being a good carpenter uh, if somebody could make a scoop and carry, ker uh, carry kerosene around the harbor and it didn't leak out. Apparently kerosene used to seep out almost anywhere. And uh, this one was made by uh, Max Pink and, uh, in Cape Lahoon. And this is the old uh, scram boxes. We have a number of them. And they used to be carried out in the open boat and uh, they used to carry their uh, food in it, but uh, everything else, too, that needed to be kept dry, you know, like engine parts, uh, the igniter, uh, trip springs, and uh, firing pins, and, uh, and, and dry mittens, and things like that. You see, they're sou'wister. Uh, it's all be kept in that. You see, everything that needed to be dry uh, was kept in that. And of course, this is being a lost art around here too, uh, in Burgio area, uh, is splitting fish. You know, there's n not too much need of splitting fish now wh where you had a fish plant. And uh, in other parts of Newfoundland, of course, they still split their fish, so uh, that is not an antique. But uh, And uh, over here we have the thole pen. I suppose everybody know about that, but uh, you had to make these too, the thole pen. It was used for rowing. You needed two of them. And uh, here's the old-fashioned fish jigger here, uh, a squid jigger, rather. And uh, it used to always be fun catching, jigging squid. And I think this particular one was made by Chris Matthews, uh, I was told. And uh, this is very interesting to me. It tells a lot about our history. This is a discharge certificate uh, uh, of Simeon Spencer. He's uh, the father of John Spencer and the father of a good many more, I think, I understand. He had a lot of children, but he was a mate on a foreign-going boat, the Bastion. And this certificate was uh, good for a voyage to Portugal and return. And he got his discharge uh, on the 12th day of the fifth month in 1929. See, and uh, what's particularly interesting to me is a character of conduct, very good, Mark Derlo, and character of ability, very good, you see? And, uh, and he got his certificate of discharge when he, after his trip back, and it was issued by the Board of Trade, but uh, it was a foreign-going captain. And this particular thing is of interest to me, too. Uh, this is called a knitting card. If you were going to knit, you know, lobster heads or make new knits, like knit a salmonet. Well, this is not big enough for a salmonet. But you, uh, you tie your knots when you make the mesh over this so you have them all at the same size. And I've knitted, of course, uh, uh, headings for, uh, for lobster pots. And I've mended nets, too, but... Uh, I, first time I've seen that for a long, long time. You see, it's just a measure, that's all. And uh, this is a particular interest. Uh, this is the one thing I would love to have uh, here. This is a puncheon, and uh, it's down in Red Webb's store now. But I couldn't get it in the school because it's too big, because it's 90 gallons. It's a 90-gallon barrel, and uh, it uh, was brought here. It's called a puncheon. And it was brought here at, uh, from Cape Lahoon uh, about 45 years ago in a motor dory. Originally, it was bought in, uh, in St. John's, brought to Cape Lahoon by a sailing schooner uh, full of molasses. And uh, I would love to have had uh, that puncheon on display. But, uh, and this is the old schooner, of course, the sailing schooner. And uh, there's no dories on it, but it was made by Mr. John Spencer. And it's very well done. It's very neatly done. And this is the old uh, corks that were used in the nets. You see, today probably they will use floats. But this is for a salmonet. This one is used for a hearing net. 
and sometimes when they could not get the cork, they made their own, uh, or they wanted to mark their net in case it drifted away, and this one was made by uh, Max Pink of Cape Lahoon. And that's where Max Pink came from. And this is the lid, the hand line lid, you see, that uh, you, you bait your hooks and you let your uh, line down and you would catch, there were two hooks on it. So the most you could catch on, on it was two fish. And believe me, that was enough to, and this is the first one I've ever seen, but I've heard tell that there were lots around, an adjustable one. Uh, if you go in uh, shallow water, fish in shallow water, you needed uh, a lid of a certain weight. And of course, if you uh, went into deeper water, you know, up to 120 fathoms or so, and probably deeper, that you needed to adjust this. You either needed to take it off in, uh, or to head on some more. And uh, this is a whole skiff. And this is the kind, I was a school dropout, you know, when I took uh, grade nine. And uh, I used to go fishing uh, in a boat like this. I fished for one summer uh, in Trapassi in a two-dory boat, six men. I was the cook. A lot of them out there heard about my experiences as a cook. And, uh, you know, that uh, we used to fish in that kind of a boat. So it had a lot of memories for me. This particular boat here is... Uh, from, Lu uh, I think it used to fish out of Lewisburg, and uh, it's the Point Pleasant, and I know my brother-in-law used to go over to Nova Scotia and fish on this particular boat. I think so did Roy LaFosse, and he t told me that uh, it's still afloat, it's, uh, it's uh, a scallop dragger right now over there somewhere, but uh, it's earlier model, you see, this is a wooden boat, and that's a, it's a side trawler, that means, of course, they hold the net over the side of the boat, <coughs> like this one. This is the model of the burr fish. It's uh, getting racked up now, but it's weathered more storms in the family of children that, where it lived uh, than the parent boat. And they hold the net in over the side. They don't have any of these around here now. Well, there, there's one up by the wharf, the burr hound, I believe. Uh, but this was a, a, a steel boat, whereas the Point Pleasant was a, was a wooden boat. And of course, this is the battery tester. In these dories, in this motor dory here that I'll show you in just a moment, that was made by a, a Mr. Uh, Percy Stone, who is deceased now, uh, a very skillful man. Uh, and they used to have uh, dry cell batteries, four or five of them connected up on a coil like this. And... Uh, that was that is a coil for a make and break engine, and they used to test out their batteries, you see, because they needed good batteries. If they didn't, they would have to roll back in, and nobody wanted to do that. And uh, anyway, it would be too dangerous, perhaps. So that the, I have two battery testers there, and this, of course, is a ship's compass here, and it has a a, a history too. But uh, I lost that history. I had it some time ago. Uh, and I lost it, and unfortunately, uh, I did that. Now, this motor dory, this is the motor dory, and uh, it had an engine in it. You see, either uh, three Acadia, or three Atlantic, uh, four Acadia, uh, uh, or, or Atlantic, and same as five. I think that was about the largest engine they would put into that, five Acadia or five Atlantic. and. Uh, they used to go fishing in that. You see, my father always went, uh, went fishing in a, in a dory like that. And uh, the Mr. Stone here even put a hinge in this one that, uh, that worked. <laughs> and how he did that, of course, shows that he was a very, very skillful man. And uh, that, uh, I expect, is a lost art too now. And this is the roll dory here, you know. Uh, they had no engine, and, and here's the thole pins here. They had them tied on, you see, and uh, that, that's a nice job there, too. And uh, they used to pack their lobsters and salmon at one time, and this came from Cape Lahoon. I don't know what date, but it's very old. Packed by Arthur Bay, Cape Lahoon, Newfoundland, and uh, it was lobster, and people used to can their own lobsters and ship it away, you see. And this uh, particular thing is a torch that was used 
aboard of skiffs like that and schooners too. They used to bait up on the cabin here, and uh, before daylight they would light this, and that would help them to see, and uh, it would be full of kerosene. The wick there is almost gone now. And when they go to throw out their gear, you see, they used to take it aboard of the dory with them to throw out their gear before daylight. And of course, you had to hoist these dories out uh, over the side of the boat. So therefore, the uh, dories were separated from the parent ship, you see. So uh, you, you needed to carry one of these, uh, a, fog, uh, a dory horn, to sometimes, because they had no radars back then. You see, when you get lost in the fog, down to Passy, it was always foggy. You run out of the fog just, or run into it just like a bank, you see. And this is in a conch here. And I was told that uh, it's a, a, a shell, perhaps come from the tropical seas, I'm not quite sure. It take a lot of breath to blow it. I think you have to know how to do it. But they used to uh, blow it when you come in close to the land and you get a heckle, and then they would know that they were close to land, you see. And uh, this particular kettle, I want to show you this because this is a lost art too. This was made by Mr. Chris Matthews. It's made it of... Uh, uh, stainless steel, and uh, it will never rust, and he still makes these. He was a tinsmith, and he picked up that heart, I think, uh, from his father, and, uh, well, they were, some people are just born skillful, that's all. And, uh, and this over here, I must show you this, uh, th this is a, what they call a stick-in tommy, and it was used in the forecastle of ships like this, uh, schooners, and they stick it in the mast, foremast, and that would light up down in the forecastle, the, the candle there. <coughs> and uh, this is a sextant here, about 150 years of age. It's still in pretty good condition, and it was used on the sailing schooners that uh, went from Burgio to... Uh, foreign ports, whether that was West Indies or, or over in Portugal to carry over the fish. And most of the captains perhaps didn't know, have too much education, but still they could take their bearings from the sun, probably stars too. And, and that's uh, the instrument there. Uh, this one came from a Harris, uh, but this one here was from Captain uh, Dix, a uh, Captain Dix. It's not all there, but uh, it's a sextant. And these uh, things, of course, I suppose are u still used today. This is the parallel ruler, and uh, this is sort of a, a divider-like uh, thing uh, to take off courses on charts. And this is a chart here, a map of the sea. And this particular bottle here uh, is of particular interest. It was hauled up by Mr. George Ingram. That's not George Bell, but George Ingram on a fish hook like that from a depth of 130 fathoms. And for the young people uh, today who are gone into metric, which I know nothing about, there were six feet in a, in a fathom. So that would be about 780 feet, you see, all up like that. <clears throat> and this is the roller that I probably, they still use it. This one, of course, it shows how uh, resourceful, I suppose, our people were. It, had so much use that the whole original holes wore out, and they drilled some more. This, of course, uh, is not the original either, uh, because the original one should look like this, the lid in there. The lid has gone to this one too. It's and, and this is a a log uh, that was. There was another instrument on the uh, rail of the boat, on the stern of the boat. And uh, this was uh, a drag behind the boat uh, on a line, and this would turn around, and uh, it would register on the thing, the machine that they had, the instrument they had on the rail of the boat, how many miles the boat would go, and the captain would time it. The time was very important. Uh, if they, he could tell how many miles they had gone in an hour, and from that they could figure out how long it would take them to go, or where they're... Uh, position at sea is. This is a, of interest too. This is an insulator that came off of the old telegraph line. It was transatlantic. It came across the Atlantic Ocean uh, by submarine cable. 
It came ashore down in uh, Conception Bay somewhere. Of course, it was laid by the Great Eastern. And uh, then there was a land line uh, from the East Coast right to Port of Bass, Cape Ray. But there was a substation up in uh, Grandy's Brook. And this particular one was, uh, Hanselator was found down in the Bay de Lou area, about 10 miles in the country. And uh, it was found by uh, Lester James when he was moose hunting at one time. See, and it's uh, really a part of our history for sure. And uh, <coughs> this is another lamp that was used in the forecastle of uh, a schooner. And uh, it was made in such a way that uh, no matter how the ship moved, you know, whether it went, you know, pitching into it or rolling from side to side, this lamp was always upright. You see, it had such weight in it. And that was a kerosene lamp. And uh, this, of course, is a, a glass and float, but it's very old because the netting here, uh, the twine that's in the netting and the trawl line, they don't use that anymore and the rope, it's a manila rope, and it's full of tar, you see, but it's very, very old. And this is the old bed warmer here. Uh, people used to warm up their beds uh, with bricks and uh, uh, chunks of birch uh, to, uh, and flat irons. They could get it, uh, eat it up and put it in the bed in the winter time, you see. And uh, I tell you, it was helpful. I don't know if you ever got into a cold bed, but it's worse getting out in the mornings. And this is a nipper. They used to put this on their hands to haul, get a good grip on what they were hauling, you see? They put the line there. They were hauling up their gear. And another thing, it would save their hands, of course, uh, because you can get pretty bad. Yeah, this is a halibut scraper. It was used to scrape the blood out of halibuts. Now, uh, Fishermen around, around, around my home, and here too, I suspect, used to go halibut fishing specifically uh, in the spring of the year. And uh, they used to clean their halibut. And this is halibut keller, or it was used for that. I don't know if it was made especially for that. The person I got it from didn't exactly know what it was for. But uh, the halibut, of course, to take it in a big one, to take it in board of the boat that you needed it dead. So uh, they uh, killed it first. And uh, perhaps Greenpeace would be after them today. And this is a glass and float, of course, like I showed you up there. Only thing, this one is green and it's not knitted in. It had to be knitted in like that in order to tie on the gear or the nets. It would keep the uh, nets up from the bottom or the gear up from the bottom. And this particular lamp here is not from Burjo area. It came from a lighthouse in, uh, in Rose Blanche on Cane's Island. It's kerosene operated, and uh, they used to put the kerosene in it uh, from this kind of a jug here, you see. And it uh, might be from a buoy or a danger uh, signal. It was red anyway. And this particular item here is another lamp, but it's a bin uh, binnacle lamp. It was used to light up the compass, the ship's compass, at night. A kerosene lamp, it's, it's also brass. And this particular uh, binnacle lamp came from the Schooner Adventure. And uh, she was coming from Sydney, North Sydney, with a load of coal. And she was lost during a, a strong gale on Bering Island near Wreck Island in July 1918, and all the crew uh, were saved, and the ship was totally wrecked. And this uh, roll here is a roll of wrappers that came from one of the first fish plants in Burgio, or the first owner then. It was uh, uh, fishery products, uh, and it was cod cutlets. Blue Water uh, was the brand, and uh, they used to sell it down in Boston, Massachusetts. and. Uh, is not too colorful, as you can see. And of course, this is the old kelic here. And uh, they used to make their own uh, kelics, a homemade hanker that was, that was weighed down by a rock. And this is what we used to call withs here, that used to go on, or bands, that used to go on over here. This one is tied on with line, but uh, they used to make their own. And I can remember 
you needed a lot of strength to twist these sticks in like that. It's, it's twisted very well. And it was hammered on here, it was nailed on here to keep the kelic together so the rock wouldn't fall out. And these lamps here, of course, this is the old kerosene lamp, and it doesn't have a chimney. Uh, but this is a, a candle lamp, and it was homemade, and uh, they used to use it instead of a flashlight uh, out, out of doors, and uh, it didn't blow out, you see? And you can see that you, in order to get the chimney off to light it, you would, there were springs on it, you could take it off there. It had particular interest to me because I had a hat who used to carry one, and uh, that's why it's of particular interest to me. And this, of course, they used to knit in their bottles. Uh, this bottle probably, if I dropped it on the floor, may not break. Uh, they used to carry this as a water bottle in the dories, especially the banking dories. And uh, this was picked up on uh, sandbanks by a Mr. William Billard uh, a long time ago, about 70 years ago. It was picked up on sandbanks, this particular bottle. And of course, this is the Tilly lamp here. This came in after the Aladdin lamp. This was, you know, in when the electricity came. And uh, it, it operated something like a gas light or a Coleman lamp. You had to pump it up here. But also, of course, you had to light it with a mop. You had to put some, uh, dip this into some spirits in the, of some kind and, and light it, like duplicating fluid. And uh, <coughs> This is a developing lamp here. You develop your own pictures in, with this. It's a red light there, the red glass there. And uh, again, that was operated by kerosene. And this was a homemade brass lamp that was used in barns. It would be hung up on the side of the wall. And uh, there are another m number of other lamps, but this one have had particular interest for me uh, to show the resourcefulness of our people. The base was broken off of this lamp, you see, and instead of throwing away the lamp, which we would have done, in fact, if the, this part had been broken, we would have thrown it away, perhaps today, uh, they put a new base on it. They used a can, a lobster can or a salmon can, and they very skillfully put it there. And that's over 100 years old, and you see, it's, the can is all rusted out now. So, and, and this little one here uh, is can be put, stood up, or it can be put on the wall like that, look. And it has a very, uh, a round wick in it, and it's a kerosene lamp, a very hold. And this, of course, is a cake dish that is about uh, uh, 70, it's 73 years of age, this is, and it's very well decorated, as you can see. And I, I dare say this is of great value today. And this is a jug that is very old too, but I don't have too much of a history on it, but it's very old and it's very well decorated, see? And uh, this is the Aladdin lamp here, but a lot of them used to, you could either hang them up or put them uh, on the wall. There was a bracket to put them on the wall. And th this particular one was to stand up on the table. It was a mantle lamp and uh, it was rather dangerous. If you didn't watch it, it would burn up, and it would give off a dangerous gas. And uh, it, it would catch a fire, too, probably. Uh, but uh, this lamp uh, came in before the Tilly lamp, you see? So there was a progression of lamps. And of course, this is the old chamber pot before the, we had the plumbing, indoor plumbing. And you keep that under the bed, and you know for what purpose. And this is the old pail, pail, you see, the house pail. And that used to be the toilet, you see. So that's a part of our history too, a very important part. You can be sure of that. You couldn't live without it. And this is a, a set here. It not only have a basin and a jug set, but also has a soap dish to, to match. And no doubt it would have gone on the washstand that we saw just now. And this is of particular interest. This is, you can't see it very well, perhaps, but it's an old uh, slide projector. And uh, it used to go by kerosene. You see, there was a, uh, 
you light up the kerosene lamp inside, and it had glass slides, like that, you see? The, the glass slides were there. And, uh, that is very cold. There's no doubt about that. As you can see, the people preserved uh, things very well. And this is a potato killer, uh, peeler here. When we were married, I remember I used one of these. I didn't get along too well, so I took the knife. But you, I don't exactly know how you would operate it now, but you would hook the potato on and just peel it, and the blade there would peel it. And uh, I don't know if this is how much it would cost, but uh, there's a, it says $2.85 here. And uh, it was from Mr. Lewis Moulton. I don't know who that is. Uh, Steamer Street, Virgil. You know where Steamer Street is? Okay. And this particular jug here was dragged up by the uh, dragger Burhound uh, between Ramy and Virgil. See? I didn't have anything belonging to Ramy, so I said, that's it. Uh, that's the thing I'm going to say I came from Ramy. And this, is, I'm told, was a molasses. Uh, jug, it probably would be carried in the scram box or in the woods or when they were hunting. Uh, but that's what it was used for. I don't know the original use. Now, perhaps that was not the original use. And this, of course, is the flour sifter. People used it around here had to make their own bread and everything else that they uh, needed in the pastry line, and they sift their flour. I'm not quite sure, though, why they sift their flour, but they did. And this is a wine decanter. It's very old, uh, but uh, the glasses used to go there. You see, it was like a tray. And it's, as you can see, it was a beautiful set at one time. It still is. And this is the old meat grinder. You see, it is a grind minster meat, I suppose. But the person I know who owned uh, one used to grind up their pork. They called it a pork grinder, which... That was the use that they had. And this is of particular interest here. This is a tobacco cutter. They couldn't afford to buy a plug of tobacco. This is one was made uh, in the shape of a plug of tobacco. Stick tobacco, jumbo. They used to get the beaver too. And they used to go and buy letters. And I think it used to cost five cents a letter. Yeah. And that's the hold down on that handle and cut it off. You see, there are three of them here. Two of the others are much bigger than that. And this is the old ice cream maker. Uh, you used to make your ice cream at soup suppers, especially. Uh, the, the, the can inside, uh, the container inside was filled with milk. Not uh, full, of course, but uh, the milk was put inside. I believe sugar was put there. I know it was, and some vanilla. And uh, then you put ice and salt in here. The, the salt would help to melt the ice, I suppose, and make it cold. And, but you had to wink it around. And of course, boys usually did that, including me. When I grew up, I used to make ice cream for a free ice cream. And I think when I grew up, you'd do almost anything for free. In fact, in many cases, you were forced to do it for nothing. But in the case of making ice cream, we'd get a free one. And this is a whole uh, wooden uh, scoop for flour, and it was handmade. You see, and it's very old. And this is an old kerosene st stove here. And I don't think that there are too many around there now of that nature. And uh, it's about 50 years of age, and they said that uh, sometimes it was used to cook on. And probably you could put the kettle on there um, because they're the top here, look. So. But, and now if we could uh, just move here for uh, a moment. Uh, this is the part of the bridle that came from one of the first horses here in Virgil. And uh, this is a very old-fashioned camera, you see? And, uh, and this is another camera here with the flash. You, if you're going to take pictures in, indoors, you would have to con connect up this flash and I was very lucky. And you put the bob in there, you see? And that would go off. This one has never been used. Uh, it was almost used that time, but for the wrong purpose. But 
And <coughs> here you see is the uh, earthen jugs here. And uh, this one is of particular interest. It was brought up by one of the scuba divers that we have around here. It was found off in the Hunts area. Uh, it was broken in two. One piece of this here was found on one side of Hunts Harbor and the other uh, piece was found on the other side and uh, it was brought here to Burgio and put together. Now how it did that, I don't know, even know how wide Hunts Harbor is, but that's what happened. And this is a wine keg here and uh, it was used in uh, the Mr. Moulton store here. I, uh, I don't know any more about it than that. To keep a drop of wine in. And uh, marked on that lid, it's not too visible, but uh, they wrote it off for me again. And there's a verse, you see. And he certainly probably had a sense of humor. It says, In God we trust when we go on a bust. Suffer we must for being unjust. So it was by Jim Moulton. That was... Uh, I don't know who Jim Moulton was, but the keg was owned by John Moulton. And all of these, of course, uh, everything used to come in these jars, I'm told, even paint. But uh, they were at many uses. My mother used to uh, use them to put spruce peel. I used to use when I grew up. Uh, you would have to tie these on your rubber boots, and uh, but first you would have to go sliding on your uh, toboggan and, and make the snow really hard, and then you would uh, put on your skates and, and skate. But it was only good on hard snow, not on ice. And uh, we used to try to make the runners here as high as we could, you know, because we were really dear to this at that time. See, but uh, here's the old wood stuff. Skates. I've never seen too many pairs of them. So they're very, very cold, these are. And they, they also put these on your boots too, but I'm not sure how you would put them on. 
somebody else would be able to explain them to you. But they are ice skates. You can uh, skate on, on the ice on the pond with this. But they, there are little uh, nails sticking up there of sort. And uh, I, I think it's going to add something to do with. I told the uh, boys today use the stilts. Uh, George Ingram, George Bill made these for me. <coughs> but uh, I think they're used today too, but some of them used to put them really high. They were also daredevils on that too. And here's the slate and the pencil. Uh, the, uh, yes, the slate and the slate pencil. And when the, you started the school, you didn't have an exercise book or a scribbler. You had a slate to write on. And you would have to carry your bottle of water and your rag to clean it off. See? And uh, a good many people used to, uh, you know, sometimes spit on their rag and clean it off. But that was not health rules, of course. And if you were caught, you may be punished for it. Okay, uh Exercise book here belonged to uh, Mrs. Short, Mrs. Hannah Short. Uh, she is deceased now, but uh, she is the mother of George Short uh, and Marjorie Short. And she went to school for a very little while, uh, but she had a letter come from the Department of Education commending her on the excellent work that she did. Now, I can't read all of that, but uh, it really <coughs> congratulates Mrs. Short on, uh, <coughs> on the uh, good work and very neat work that she did in such a short time. Okay, and uh, uh, Mrs. Short at that time uh, was married and uh, had uh, a number of children. See, but Previous to that, she had only ever gone to school one year. And uh, here's some of the neatness of her work, some of the work that she did. You see, she learned to be an excellent writer, very neatly done. And uh, it was only after a few months in school, you see. And uh, my writing is improving, it says there. And, uh, and she did some arithmetic. Mathematics then. And uh, here she had to learn her tables, her three times tables, four times tables. Because, of course, uh, even though she was an adult, that she had never gone to school, so she had to learn it. And here's a letter that she wrote. And she got very nicely written there. And uh, it was here's a copy that she did. My address is around counter west. You see, because that's where Mrs. Short came from. And uh, it was really uh, very neat work that she did. <coughs> now this book here uh, is a non-identified book. It's a Newfoundland series. It's for grades one and two. Uh, it has a lot of British influence here, as we can see. And, uh, but nobody seemed to be able to identify it. Uh, and there's a lot, of, of course, of information in there, social studies, and it appears to be a social <coughs> studies book, but uh, nobody seems to be able to identify. And all these books here, by the way, uh, are school books. Some of them are grade six books, and uh, I don't think they were called grade six at that time. And here's a royal reader. Uh, these are, this is a very old one here. And, uh, <coughs> Not sure about the date here. I don't think that's given, but it's a royal reader. But, uh, yes, and we 
have some old Bibles here, too. Of course, old family Bibles. And I uh, just want to hear to Mrs. Cosser, Mrs. Thomas Cosser. And uh, it's very old. The date here, one of the dates is 1837. Or, uh, one of these people were born. They used to keep their important dates in these books. Okay. And, uh, it was a family Bible. It was uh, read by the family, you see. I can remember when I grew up that we used to have a very large Bible. And uh, before we went to bed, that Bible was brought out on the table. My father and mother uh, used to sit down to read it. Yeah, usually from the New Testament, because they didn't have any education. And my mother would read one verse, and my father would read another verse, until they get the whole chapter read. It was, a, it was a, called a family Bible. And this is an inkwell that belonged to Magistrate Small that was here at one time. He must have been a very influential man here in Virgil, because we have a picture up there that came from the motel. And one of the people we had here last night said, when he saw Mr. Uh, Mr. Small's picture, he said, oh, here's the king of Burgio. So uh, he must have uh, been a domineering man. Okay. And here's an old pencil box here with many different items in it. And uh, the eraser, but uh, the nibs to the old pens, you see the old uh, nib pens here and erasers and a pencil sharpener here. Here's a pencil sharpener uh, and uh, many other items in that pencil box. And here's a fancy pen here, see? You, you uh, had to have your bottle of ink and you fill it up this way by uh, filling up, up that way. Because you see inside there's a little tube, see? And, uh, that's what would fill up with ink. And you could write for quite a while before you have to fill it up again. Whereas, of course, if you were going to use this kind of a pen, you would have to be constantly uh, dipping it in the ink and writing, you see? Yes, and here's a particular interest to me. Uh, it's a, uh, this picture, it was put on, uh, developed on tin. It's a tin plate. So I think there are different names to it. But uh, it's on much the same principle as, uh, I think, putting pictures on wood. It's very old and it's getting really worn now. But uh, that's how it's tin, you see? It's a tin plate picture. Okay. Now probably we could have a look at uh, these saws here. This is an ice saw here. They saw the ice of a muddy old pond in blocks, about uh, three feet by two feet with this kind of saw. And uh, <coughs> they used to have to use these tongs to take up that ice, you see? With that, you stick it in there, it's, it's tom, tongs, ice tongs. And of course, you couldn't use the block ice like uh, it came out of the pond, so you would have to chip it up into small pieces with this ice chipper. And uh, here's the old uh, cross cut saw used <coughs> for sawing up wood. And uh, that's what it's for. And here's the old buck saw. It was made by somebody. See, they made their saw. They got a blade and they made a saw. Now, they probably could have a look at this saw here. Now, this is a very large saw. Called a pit saw. Now the uh, pit saw was used to saw uh, logs into lumber. See, and uh, they used to build a scaffold. And one fellow would get up the top, you see, and I'd stand up on the scaffold. The other fellow would get down the bottom and all down. The one would go up, the other one would go down. But the one down under would have to wait.
just now. And uh, but you, it, you have to wink this up and uh, and drill a hole that way. And uh, the way you're going to you really drill a hole still. Okay. And uh, it's probably able to uh, take a look back here. This is uh, the lectern that came from the lodge, or the orange lodge here. It is about uh, 120 years old. And this is a, an old family Bible. This is a very large Bible. If you remember, we have it one much the same size as that. You see, and usually between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a, a register, a family register, where you know, where people got married and, uh, and they died and the children that they had and uh, uh, see, the births and, and the marriages and the deaths. See, that's, that was all recorded. Yes, and this is a, a very old book. A very precious one. See. This one here, uh, is, uh, this is a, to certify that Halbert Henry Foote and uh, Ethel Sarah Ham Matthews were united by me in holy matrimony at Virgil on the 24th day of April, 1918, in the year of our Lord, in the uh, presence of, and uh, it's uh, Pictor, or I suppose probably it should be Rector, Cunningham. Was P I C T O R there, but I think they meant R. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, well, here's a fish for, of course. They don't use this any longer. When I was on a fish collector over Ramy, I used that a good many times. And, uh, but you're not supposed to use it now because of the quality of the fish. They're trying to get away from using forks. Every time you stab the fish with a fish fork, you bruise it. And here is the rake. And some people still use that, but you rake the snow. You see, leak snow away. But, uh, you know, it's also used for the, the dragers, too, I think, to put down the, or side trawlers, to put down the uh, fish down below. And, uh, this is the uh, light that came from uh, an island uh, down around Beirut, and it was back to Hopley. It, uh, it went by back ways. And this is a wooden uh, uh, block. The, the sheave in here, the pulley in here, is, uh, is wooden too. See? But it's all wood except the metal that keeps it together. And this is an old pump here that they used to use. I remember people putting this in gasoline drums and, and pumping out gasoline, see, into, into the containers. That, that's very old, too. And this object here is called a jerdy, and they used to use this to uh, haul up heavy objects. But I, I, I think uh, it was explained to me that uh, Greatest use was, was if you're going to haul up a hanker or something, and if it was in bottom, uh, you would break it out. One fellow told me uh, many dories have been capsized by, you know, winking to our on that, and drawing them, turning them over. But that's what it was for. It's a girdy. It was sort of a winch, and winch. And of course, this is a, a set dog, and uh, we'll see in a moment about. Uh, Notch block, but they used to put that, you see, in a stick and in the warp or the floor, whatever they were, uh, wherever they were chopping the stick to keep it steady. That was, that was a set. And this is a salmon boy here. It's still used, of course, but uh, in some places. But uh, you tie one end on the salmon and the other end on the hand. Uh, we've got salmon eggs on board on the way. <coughs> now this is the old tree, Acadia, Inja, that's the kind that they used to use for the dories. Probably in some places they still have them. See, I thought I heard 
and not very long ago around here in Virgil, the sound of uh, one of these ancients. See? And, uh, but that's the kind of ancient that they used to use. This, uh, this is a particular one is a three Acadia. But you can get the three Atlantic, three Atlantic, four Acadia, and four Atlantic, and five Acadia, and uh, six Atlantic. But I dare say you can get different ones than that. And this uh, particular thing is of interest, of course. This is the vertebrae or part of the backbone that came from the whale, Moby Josephine. The whale that caused all the fuss here in Virginia. That probably caused early moat to leave too, I'm not sure. And this is a keg here, it was used to, you know, to, uh, as a float for uh, gear and, and nets. Uh, but later, this particular one was used to uh, uh, hold cod liver coil. They used to save their, the, the uh, cod livers and put them in barrels and drums at the wharf. The sun would uh, extract that oil. Uh, and from the livers, and they would go down and dip it off in little small uh, cans or whatever they had, and put it into bigger containers. And this is what this one was used for, to uh, put the cod liver oil in. Okay. Now, here is the, the entertainment section, I suppose. This is the accordion, and this one is well over 100 years page and it was used to play for dances, mostly square dances I expect when they used to have the soup suppers. And this is the old gramophone here. And uh, you had to wind it up, wind it up. The, you know, there's the handle's gone now, but uh, they used to wind it up from this uh, end here. And this is the kind of record that they used to uh, use on it, the old 78. And, uh, th this is the kind of uh, needle. Every two or three records, you have to change your needle. And of course, this is the old time radios here. You have to have a battery on the outside. The batteries are very large. And uh, people didn't listen to their radios uh, as much as they do now because of the expense of the battery. Uh, but they used to use uh, uh, the radio to listen to uh, certain programs, especially the journalist Doyle would do uh, them. Uh, the news, uh, it was international news, national news, and local news, but more especially on the journalist Doyle bulletin, they used to give out messages, you know, that people were away and gone to the hospital. And I broadcast a number of messages on. Gerald Doyle bulletin. And when I got to summer school in the university, people from home in the general hospital uh, sick. And this one was a transistor radio. There's still some around, I understand. But this particular one is Bottle McCallum. I bought it one, uh, in 1960. And uh, it was one of the first transistor radios that came around to McCallum. This particular one was in a shipwreck. Uh, the fish collector there had a ship to shore set on, but he couldn't receive uh, uh, on his set. So he borrowed my radio, which has a marine band on it. See? And uh, he ran his boat to ground, and it later sank, and that's the only thing that he saved with my radio. I'm sorry he wasn't afraid of me, though. But uh, he, and this is the old skull pot here. You had to scald your clothes. Uh, put it on and, and put the jillet's lie in, in there and scald the clothes. That was the teaching. And we have some iron pots here, you can see. And this is the old iron kettle. See? It must have been heavy when it was full of water. But it would stay hot for quite a long time. And here we have the old black irons, of course, many different kinds. This one here has been handled made on it. But uh, this one here, the handle will come off, you see? Uh, and you have to have the fire in, in your stove to make these kind of hot. And even if, if uh, it was in summertime, you would have to have a big fire in. It would be very hot. You had to do your firing. It was in the days when you had 
didn't have the rental free clothes, I can tell you that. But this is a Tilly uh, iron, and it went like gas, but you had to pump it off, like you would, uh, you, know, you know, gas light. But you didn't, of course, have to put this one on the stove. The gas, actually, would uh, keep it uh, warm. And, and this is the iron base. You know, uh, here you, you fix the heel on the shoe, you put the tap on the shoe, this is an adult, uh, for an adult shoe here, and this is for a child's shoe. And uh, this one was a child's lace or iron foot, we sometimes call it, you see? Yeah. And uh, probably, just very quickly now, we would say that uh, <laughs> this is a, a corking outfit, <coughs> see? We're corking the bolt. Uh, that the man who was going to do the corking would sit down on that box and uh, he would have his whole thing in here and as he corked, he would cool it out. And uh, sometimes, of course, that uh, the carpenter was too good a carpenter, the seams weren't big enough, so they made the seams with this instrument here, which is called a making iron. You would have to make actually make a seam. And then you would use this kind of corking iron the uh, hole come in. I have some uh, uh, corking cotton there. But you see, you would fill this uh, a thing here full of grease. And you would have, you know, every now and again dip your corking iron into this grease so that when you put the hole come in that you wouldn't pull it back out. If the iron was dry, you would pull the hole come out again. So you had to keep it wet with grease. But, but that is the corking pouch in there. Um, an old made box. And this, of course, is a notch block. And if you were going to chop out a stick or patterns or whatever you wanted the stick chopped out for, you would fit it in here so it wouldn't move. Probably you would get the set dog down there and, and put in the other end because you could not chop with the stick going to move around. And we do have a knife razor here, but this one is badly broken. They used to shave with the, with the old knife razor, and they used to sharpen that on a strap. This is one kind of strap, and this is the other kind of strap. And uh, they used to put this one on the uh, chair and just sharpen their their wages. And again, we have the old uh, tobacco cutters. And here's a pitch pot here, and sometimes you would uh, run lid, melt lid in it, and, and pour it into molds. You see, this out here. And, uh, and here we have uh, some uh, loading outfits for a rifle called 4570 rifle. And uh, here's a mold for making the bullets. Here's a bullet that you can make by pouring the lid down in that hole there. You would get a bullet like that, you see? And then you would load up your shell. And uh, this is the outfit that you would use. Now you had to use that in a particular way. You would put the cap, I believe, in your shell uh, with this instrument here. And you would also put your shell, your bullet, in this section here and, and put the power. And, and this is an outfit that you look at, I think, uh, shop shell, I'm not quite sure about that though. And uh, here is the old brass shell uh, they used to use. And they can use that over and over and over. And this is the old soldering iron. These are solder things. They used to use the old soldering iron. And this is a cooper axe for making barrels. Now, I think this is, uh, you used this probably to put the uh, hoops on the barrels. Yeah. And here, if you could uh, come over here, you'd get a glimpse of the old cranes that they used to use. Same the old wooden cranes of many different makes. This one is of particular interest here. It's uh, 
called a 45 uh, angle plane, and I think it was used for making molding. And uh, there are many blades to that. I would like to show you the number of blades that could be used in that particular plane. I don't think there are too many around now. And here's all the blades that you could possibly use in that, huh? of different sizes. And they look pretty sharp even today. Here's a very narrow one here. Huh? And all of that would fit in that particular plane. Uh, uh, but I think it was mostly made for making molding. Uh, and uh, I think that's what, uh, that's what I was told anyway. But it must have had a particular use. Now, I should just move very quickly around here uh, and have a look at the old cut rate sled. This, this sled here used to be used in the country in the wintertime for all of the caribou and also moose. This one was used by Max Payton from Cape Lagoon. And Max tells me that he dragged a good number of caribou on that one. Not illegally, of course. And here's the old foot machine. It, it would operate, they had a band down there. You push on this lever here, and, uh, and this would turn around. See, but I, I, I don't think that's so very old, though. But it's not used too often today. And this, of course, is the old hand sewing machine. You had to, you had to turn, turn it with your hand. And this particular, not this bolt, but there's one down there. Uh, these kind of bolts came from ships. The, the planes put on the, the timbers with that particular one. Uh, so the, the, this kind of a bolt. So we do have a bolt down there. And this is the hats. It, it, it sort of worked in reverse of the hatchet, but it was used to get that hard to get at places, like building bolts. And if a piece of plank, one piece is sticking out over the other, you would, you know, be able to do that and trim it off. And probably lastly, uh, if we could, uh, have a look at this stick. This is some kind of a measuring stick. It's owned by Joe Iscoff, and he's very anxious to know uh, what it was used for. And uh, it seems to have the same markings, but uh, it's all different. The one start here and it goes all around here, you see? And it drops down as it goes. And the same thing here. And it has eight sides. But it's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, but nobody seemed to know what, what that particular stick was used for, but it was some kind of a measuring stick. And so if anybody out there would like to offer suggestions, we would be happy to know. But perhaps lastly, though, we could have a, a brief look here. Uh, this is a butter churn that was used by Morgan Billard. Morgan Billard was the last family to live on the sandbanks. They used to live up by the cemetery. And they had two cows, and uh, his wife, I'm told, used to come down to the stores here twice a day with the milk. You know, and... Uh, I'm sure if he did not need the exercise in the evening. And here's the cow bells. They made their own. They're different. But they were homemade. And uh, here's a butter print here. You fill this, I understand, with the butter. And uh, you press it out. And, and there's a flower there. See, you make the print on the flower. And uh, here's an interesting bottle that was uh, dug up at around uh, Gilbert Melbourne's. Uh, Moulton used to use it at owned the house, I think, at one time. Not too sure about that, though. Uh, and the, say the label was painted on it. This is a cartridge, and it comes from Browning RV Company. And here it's engraved on it, another cartridge. See? And the same principle here on this uh, milk bottle here. You see, it's painted on it. And uh, this is a donut maker. See, you make your own donuts. And this particular thing is of interest too. Uh, it's uh, to hold salt, table salt. They didn't have any salt shakers, so they uh, used to put this 
a table salt in there and put it on the table. If one wanted uh, some salt, I once put, he would take a pinch of salt. I'm not sure if that's where the expression came from, you know, pinch of salt. Sure, uh, I, I couldn't say that. And here's the old pepper and salt cap. And here's of a particular interest, the ration book from 19... 40s, the, during the Second World War, they used to have, uh, I understand, uh, milk and sugar on, on ration, and you could go and get a certain amount every two weeks. That's what's on these tickets. You had to turn in one or a number of these tickets, and in order to get your allowance of milk and sugar during the Second World War. And uh, here are two receipts here uh, from 1942. It's the credit system uh, at its best, and uh, the amount of fish that's caught and the, and the goods also. So I, I think that's about it. Uh, I think uh, we, if we probably could cast the camera around, and uh, I, I would like to thank the people now for uh, you know participating, for uh, allowing their uh, items to be brought in. The way they cooperated is still overwhelming to me. And uh, all of the delegates have gone home quite happy. Uh, not because of the antique display, but because of every other thing, because the people of Virgil cooperate. And I would like uh, to issue a challenge to somebody out there that, uh, to try to start a museum and to preserve some of these items, because we've only touched on the many items that have.